Yesterday I, I told you about uh, Berger's theorem and the, his classification of philonomy groups. Uh, today I want to start with um, a bit more generalities on philonomy groups and then we're going to move on to Kähler geometry. So the, the Kähler holonomy groups are U of M and SPM and SU of M uh, and well, in fact a Riemannian metric is Kähler if its holonomy group is contained in U of M. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to spend somehow most of the rest of the course on Kähler geometry because I think it's the, uh, the part of the subject which is most likely to be useful to you uh, in later life. Um, and then I'm going to spend a few lectures at the end on um, the exceptional Holland groups G2 and spin 7, just out of self-indulgence. And um, I may even miss out SPM, SP1 completely, depending on how much time we've got. Uh, anyway, um, so um, let, let me first make a few remarks on uh, Simon's, Simon's is, uh, proof of uh, Berger's theorem. Okay, so um, Jim Simons, who hangs out in Stony Brook and is now utterly obscenely rich, um, <laughs> before he was utterly obscenely rich, was a quite a decent mathematician, um, and uh, he noticed that uh, that Berger's list of holonomy groups looked rather like the, the list of Lie groups which can act transitively on the sphere. Um, so, um, okay, so Simons noticed uh, that um, Berger's list of holonomy groups <coughs> uh, is almost the same uh, as the um, well the known uh, list of um, well, Lee. Well, let's say uh, connected um, Lee subgroups H contained in S O of N, uh, which uh, act <coughs> uh, transitively on the n minus one sphere s to the n minus 1 in r to the n. Okay, so s o n acts on here, any subgroup also acts on here. Uh, so this kind of means that uh, as far as the group H is concerned, there are no special directions. Uh, any, any point in s to the n minus 1 can be taken to any other point under H. Um, uh, so if you're prepared to accept the classification of groups acting transitively on spheres, uh, then uh, that gives you a kind of starting point to more or less recover Berger's list. Uh, so, well, si so Simons basically gave a, a geometric proof uh, that um, well, a holonomy group H um, satisfying well, the, the conditions in Berger's theorem um, uh, that is, you know, uh, the manifold simply connected, the metric is uh, irreducible non symmetric, uh, must act transitively uh, on um, S to the n minus 1. So I haven't read that for a long time, so I've forgotten how it works. Uh, it, it is reasonably short, um, and I didn't write about it in the nearly infallible book, unfortunately. Um, I think you can find a, an account of it in uh, a rather older book by Simon Salomon on holonomy groups, uh, which goes back to about 1989, I think. Uh, it's in the Pittman... OK, well, so you could try uh, Simon Salomon, uh, a book. Um, you know, circuit, well, no, 1980s um, on holonomy groups, uh, published by Pittman. So I think he, he has an account of Simon's proof, 
or you could just read the paper. Um, and so once you've got that, then deducing Berger's theorem is, is just a matter of eliminating maybe a couple of possibilities which um, can act transitively on spheres but aren't actually Hilmi groups. So that um, you might prefer that <coughs> as a, uh, a kind of way of understanding where the list comes from. Okay. Um, so next, let's talk about uh, section 2.7 on holonomy groups and Ritchie curvature. Okay. Well, so well we've seen uh, that the holonomy group big H uh, of a metric G uh, places uh, linear restrictions on the Riemann curve on the Riemann curvature. Uh, big R of uh, G. Um, so basically, well, the uh, lower A, B, C, D uh, must lie in uh, a vector space, curly R, big H uh, at each point. So these are kind of candidate curvature tensors. Um, this is the kind of S2 of curly H intersect first Bianchi equals zero, as it were. Um, so it's a vector subspace of S2 of H, uh, where each H lives in the AB and the CD indices, um, satisfying the first Bianchi. Um, now, OK, so that we don't know that Every element in here can be a curvature tensor of a Riemannian metric, but we don't necessarily care about that. Um, uh, the important point now is that for some, actually most, uh, of our interesting holonomy groups, some holonomy groups, H, uh, it turns out that uh, all R, A, B, C, D in um, this space curly R, H, uh, are either Einstein or even Ritchie flat. So if you look at elements of here, there's a, uh, a linear map from there into the tensors which look like metrics, S2 of R to the n star, uh, by contracting first and third with the inverse of the metric. Um, and uh, if this is a, a smallish subspace, then that map may be zero. Um, so, well, it turns out that, um, well, firstly, uh, metrics with uh, holonomy uh, contained in SUM are at Ritchie flat. So, well, I'll be explaining this in rather more detail later when we get into the Kähler holonomy groups. Um, yeah, and well, as an aside, um, when you're talking about things with holonomy, most statements you make uh, are true not just for a metric with a given holonomy group but also for a metric with whose holonomy group is a subgroup of that group. So you get used to ri writing holonomy contained in something uh, if you want to make more general statements. Um, so a metric with holonomy uh, well let's say G whole G contained in U of M, so that G is Kähler with respect to some complex structure, um, is Ritchie flat 
if and only if um, well in fact the reduced holomy of G is contained in SU of M uh, which um, uh, then implies the holonomy group of G is contained in SU of M uh, if X, your manifold, is, is simply connected. Okay, so um, the Ricci curvature of Kähler metrics is really the difference between something which is a uh, holonomy group in U of M or something which is a holonomy group in SU of M, which is broadly Kalabi Yau, depending on your exact definition of Kalabi Yau. Okay, um, secondly, uh, metrics with uh, holonomy contained in uh, the quaternionic unitary group SP of M are also Ricci flat. So actually, this follows from A. as um, SPM is contained in uh, SU of 2M with equality if M equals 1. Okay. Um, thirdly, uh, metrics with holonomy now I'm going to say equal to, not just contained in, SPM, SP1. Um, these are Einstein. Uh, but actually not Ricci flat. Uh, so if you had a metric with polynomial contained in SPM, SP1, and it was Ricci flat, then actually the holonomy would reduce to SPM, uh, at least up to the fundamental group, so the reduced holonomy would be contained in SPM. So the, somehow the SP1 factor here uh, necessarily contributes a non-zero Einstein constant uh, if it's present. Okay, um, and then finally D and E, let's say, uh, metrics with holonomy G2 in seven dimensions and spin seven uh, in eight dimensions are also Ricci flat. Okay, so that's kind of nice. I mean, uh, there's various reasons to, to feel that Einstein metrics or Ricci flat metrics are kind of, in some sense, the best kind of metrics you can find on a given manifold. Um, you know, they're they're, they're, they're stationary for the volume form. Oh, sorry, they're stationary for the volume. What do I mean that? They're stationary for something or other. Um, uh, yeah. They're generally kind of nice classes of metrics, and then you automatically uh, get these out. Um, okay. Um, next, let's say something about holonomy groups and uh, G structures. So let me remind you uh, of a few things uh, I told you earlier in the week. So let's say X is an n-dimensional manifold. Uh, F can be the frame bundle uh, of X, which is a principal uh, GL N comma R bundle. Um, and let's say G uh, in GL N comma R can be a Lie subgroup. Um, then a G structure on X 
is some P contained in F, which is a principal subbundle with fiber G. That is, P is an embedded submanifold of F. It's fixed under the G action on F, induced by the GLNR action, and uh, then the G action on P and it's mapped down to X make it into a principal G bundle. That's what I mean by a G structure. Also, well, a connection H on um, F, the, uh, the principal, the frame bundle, uh, is some vector subbundle uh, H sitting inside uh, T, the tangent bundle of F, uh, satisfying some conditions. Um, um, so the conditions being that H is invariant under the GL in our action, and the tangent bundle of F is a direct sum of the vertical subbundle and the horizontal subbundle, H, where the vertical subbundle is a kernel of the map from TF into the pullback of TX. Um, that actually implies that H is now isomorphic to the pullback of, the, of TX. Um, okay, well, so, okay, so, so that, that's much, much I've said already. Well, so we say that P is uh, compatible with H if H restricted to P, this is now a vector per subbundle of um, the tangent bundle of F restricted to P. Uh, this is contained in the tangent bundle of P, which is contained in uh, the tangent spaces. So at each point I want the fibre of H, which is a vector subspace of the tangent space to F, to be a subspace of the tangent space to P at that point. So then, uh, sorry that's not a P, uh, oh yeah that's okay. Then H restricted to P is a connection on P. Uh, so certain connections on the frame bundle can be restricted to uh, connections on the principal bundle, uh, the uh, G structure bundle. Um, now also, uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between, well, so principal bundle connections H on the frame bundle F and vector bundle connections uh, Nabla on uh, TX, which and you can recover TX from the frame bundle F as the associated vector bundle of the usual representation of GLNR on um, R to the N. So the Okay, so I, ha I didn't ex really explain this particularly, but this is true. Um, and, uh, and Nabla has a torsion tensor, T, A, B, C. Um, so therefore any connection H on F also has a torsion tensor, T, A, B, C. Um, so you can ask, Uh, so, does a, well, let's say if P is a G structure on X, so does there exist a, a torsion free connection? Well, H which is equivalent to some nabla 
on F uh, compatible with P. Um, and if it's yes, then we call P torsion free. Okay, so this gives us a notion of torsion free uh, G structure. Um, okay, so now in general, Well, so well for any uh, G structure uh, P, uh, there exists uh, connections uh, H on F compatible with uh, P, um, and. Um, Yep. Uh, and then H gives you some torsion T A B C, and you can split um, T uh, as into two components T1 direct sum T2 lying in different vector subbundles of the vector bundle of possible torsion tensors. Um, such that basically T1 is the same uh, for any H compatible with P uh, and T2 uh, varies with H And we can, in fact, choose um, H such that T2 equals zero. Okay, so there's a, the torsion falls into two bits, one of which depends upon P, the other of which doesn't, uh, and there's enough freedom uh, to actually make the second component zero. And then we define uh, what, what we call T1. Uh, the torsion of the G structure P, uh, and in fact, um, so <coughs> this is, uh, and then the T1 equals zero if and only if P is torsion free in the obvious way. So we're living in this world of principal bundles and G-structures, which is perhaps slightly more abstract than vector bundles and metrics, but it's quite a powerful point of view uh, in some ways. Um, okay, so let's, let's look at um, how this relates to holonomy groups. Okay, so let uh, X and G be some Riemannian manifold uh, with Lomi group of G is some big H, or actually contained in H will do, um, uh, contained in S O N. Um, so then, well, so implicitly. Uh, the, the kind of the inclusion whole of G contained in S O N uh, means we've kind of chosen uh, an identification uh, T X zero of X is isomorphic to R to the N um, at least up to the action of H. So we've got some special class of identifications between 
that and this. Um, okay, it's possible I'm lying a little bit here, but I don't care. Um, that's what I want, anyway, to make that choice. Um, so now, you can now define uh, a, uh, an H structure, P on X, uh, as follows. Um, some a point little x e1 up to en lies in p. Oh, so this is in the frame bundle f. This lies in p if, uh, well, whenever gamma going from 0 up to 1 into x is a piecewise smooth path. from uh, the base point x0 to the point x we're interested in, um, then, well, p gamma inverse of the basis e1 up to en uh, is um, uh, equivalent uh, up to the action of uh, H um, in SON with the standard basis of uh, T X zero of X, which we're identifying with R to the N. Okay, so this R to the N has got its standard basis of one zero 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 one zero and so on. Um, we we trans translate that to a basis of Tx0 of x. Uh, so that gives us one possible basis of that. We're allowed to act on that with an element of h. That gives us a family of bases here. We want these guys um, to... Well, we want to look at points in the frame bundle which are translated to things of that form. So we're from x0 to x. To x. Well, so x is some, just some point in the manifold x0 is the base point which I chose to define the Holmby group with. So, uh, okay, so, and the, the reason this, this definition is independent of the path is that if I chose two different paths from x0 to x, then going round them, one in the opposite direction, will give you a loop based at x0, and the parallel transport round that would lie in h, because the Holmby group is contained in h, um, and because I'm allowing myself the freedom of moving my bases around by H, that means that two different paths from X0 to X uh, are going to give parallel transported bases differing by the action of H. Okay, so this is at least well defined. Um, okay, so then it's a fact that that P, this P is a torsion-free H structure on um, X, um, and there's a unique torsion-free connection. Uh, well, sorry, I've now got two H's. Um, well, so H here is being a Lie group. Sorry. Yep. Uh, what if we just do the thing we did at x0 at x1, so asked for, uh, for bases at x1 that uh, uh, equivalent the action to standard bases of Rn? Why do we need to go to another point in parallel transport? Um, well, because I'm, I'm, fi I'm defining my holonomy group as a subgroup of Tx0 of x, uh, okay. um, which I'm identifying with r to the n. I don't have a given identification of Tx1 at x with r to the n. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm using this parallel transport to to tell me how to identify different tangent spaces with the standard vector space R to the N. Okay, so there's a new, unique torsion... Sorry, I've, I'm, I've been using H for my... Uh, for my principal bundle connections, because it means horizontal sub-bundle. I've also been using H for my holonomy groups, as it means Lie group. So on these boards, H is, H is something different. Maybe we should just change these H's to G. Um, uh, 
G is, is a Lie group. Sorry? Um, well, you can take the holonomy group to be equal to G if you like, but it's also true if only if the holonomy group is a subgroup of G. So G is going to be any Lie subgroup of S of N, and the holonomy group has to be contained in it. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Um, uh, I really don't care. Okay, so um, <coughs> H can mean either a Lie group or a connection. Anyway, so P is a torsion free G structure on X. So there's a unique torsion free connection, Nabla, on, well, F, uh, preserve, compatible with P. which is just a levy chiever connection. Of um, the Riemannian metric G. Okay, so uh, there's this kind of rather abstract point of view, which says that um, uh, holonomy reductions gives us torsion-free G structures. Um, and, you know, this is Maybe all I'll say about this for now, but uh, it's something which can come back later. Now, if you're trying to construct, um, for example, metrics with holonomy G2 or spin 7, um, what you'd actually do is you'd build G2 structures or spin 7 structures on your um, 7 or 8 manifold, which are not torsion free. But you, have, you then have this geometric quantity, the torsion T, which could be basically the, the derivative of some uh, some things which you actually want to be constant, but which weren't. Um, and then, you know, so the torsion is kind of the error. Uh, and then you try and deform them from a, a you, you'd have some, you'd measure the torsion in a Banach space, you'd construct G, G2 structures, let's say, with small torsion. Then you want to deform them, the G2 structures, with zero torsion. So uh, this, this point of view of G structures with torsion is a very useful thing. Um, for actually constructing uh, G structures by gluing, deformation, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, right, so shall we move on to start talking about Kähler geometry? Um, So you're going to spend several lectures talking about Kähler geometry and the Kähler holonomy groups. Uh, so Kähler metrics are a kind of Riemannian metric on complex manifolds. Um, so, but they have holonomy contained in U of M, where U of M is obviously uh, the group preserving both a Riemannian metric and a complex structure on R to the N, or R to the 2N, or 2M. Um, so, section 3 on complex and uh, Kähler geometry. So I'm going to spend quite a long time just explaining uh, about complex geometry and Kähler geometry because I think it's a good thing for you uh, to know. Um, uh, so we'll start off by talking about complex manifolds. So manifolds of complex structures, and then later on we'll put the metrics on them as well, and those will be Kähler. So, um, Kähler metrics are the uh, most natural class of uh, Riemannian metrics. Uh, on uh, complex manifolds. Uh, 
Um, so we'll start with uh, well, with two different but uh, ultimately equivalent definitions of uh, complex manifolds. So the first uh, definition would be somehow the, the natural definition from the point of view of complex analysis. Uh, if you started off thinking about holomorphic functions on C and C to the N and so on, <coughs> uh, then this is how you build your definition of complex manifold. And actually, well, if you take the definition of manifold, uh, you get a topological space, setting some, find some global conditions, and an atlas of charts. And the charts consist in open subsets of R to the N and the transition mapping into your topological space, and the transition functions have to be smooth. But that's quite a versatile definition. Uh, you can replace subsets of R to the N and smooth maps between them with uh, all kinds of other things. You could use subsets of R to the N and C to the K maps between them, get a notion of C to the K manifold. Or you could take subsets of C to the N and holomorphic maps between them, that will give you complex manifolds. Or you could take um, open subsets of some Banach space and then kind of Banach smooth maps between them uh, and define Banach manifolds and so on. So the definition of manifold, you can kind of insert your favourite notion of manifold, or even manifold with corners, um, and so on, into it. Uh, and whenever you've got a kind of category of, of things like uh, things looking a bit like R to the N, uh, you can get a, um, a thing like manifolds. Uh, so here's our first definition. So uh, a complex manifold uh, is a Hausdorff. And second countable uh, topological space, big X, uh, with uh, a holomorphic atlas uh, curly A. As for real manifolds in the first lectures, I'm going to write this as a set of pairs. U i phi i, where little i lies in some indexing set big I. Uh, so now U i, instead of being in R to the n, uh, is going to be in C to the m uh, as an open set, um, uh, where m is the complex dimension of x, is some fixed. Um, natural number, um, and well, again, phi i going from our set u i into x uh, is uh, a continuous map uh, of topological spaces. It's a homeomorphism, an isomorphism in topological spaces with an open set. Uh, the image of phi i contained in x and um, the transition maps so phi j inverse of phi i uh, which now map from some open subset of c to the m into a different open subset of C to the M, basically the largest subsets uh, on which the transition map can be defined. Uh, these have to, have to be holomorphic. For all uh, I and J in the indexing set big I. So um, that's just the same as the definition of smooth manifold, but we have UIs and C to the M instead of R to the N, and we have holomorphic maps instead of smooth maps. Um, and okay, so that's kind of complex analysts definition of a complex manifold. Um, but what I'm perhaps more interested in from our point of view is a kind of real differential geometers definition of a smooth manifold, which is of a uh, a real smooth manifold together with an additional geometric structure. Uh, so let's make a second definition. 
um, which is that of uh, almost uh, complex structures. So complex structures and almost complex structures. So we'll define almost complex structures first. A complex structure is a special kind of almost complex structure. So let big X now be a real smooth uh, manifold um, uh, with the real dimension of X is going to be even. So let's take it to be 2 times M. So M will be the complex dimension of X. So then uh, an, an almost complex structure is a tensor J. Uh, in index notation, it's J, let's say lower A of a B. Uh, in the smooth sections of the tangent bundle, tensored with the cotangent bundle. We think about this as an endomorphism of the tangent bundle, so it's a, something which maps from the tangent bundle into the tangent bundle. Um, and as an endomorphism, it has j squared is minus 1, or minus the identity. Um, or in index notation, we have j a up lower a upper b, j lower b upper c is minus delta a c. OK, um, so that's an almost complex structure. And uh, the almost complex structure makes each tangent space of x into a complex vector space in which j gives you multiplication by little i and the square root of minus 1. So it uh, turns at least the, uh, the tangent bundle of x into a complex thing rather than a real thing. And we call the pair x, comma j uh, an almost complex manifold. OK. Um, so next, let's define, we say that uh, some smooth function at little f going from x, uh, well f, which can also be u plus i times v, f going from x into the complex numbers, so u is the real part, v is the elementary part, uh, is polymorphic uh, if on the derivatives j lower a b times dv, b is equal to a. So this is just the, the kind of standard cauchy riemann equations of um, complex analysis, at least if you do this, let's say, on if x is a complex numbers was a, the obvious almost complex structure. OK, so there's something called uh, the Neuenhaus tensor. This you guys probably know how to pronounce Neuenhaus better than I do, because uh, I think he's Nordic. The Neuenhaus tensor NJ uh, is the obstruction um, to the existence of uh, many um, holomorphic functions holomorphic functions locally, meaning in small open sets. So it can happen that you get an almost complex structure, uh, which is kind of bad, and then there are the only um, holomorphic functions in any open set are just constant. Okay? Um, and that's when the, the Neuenhaus house tensor is kind of maximally non-zero, as it were. Um, uh, okay, so it, it lies in um, the sections of uh, Tx tensored with lambda 2 T star of x. So it's a 
tensor of the type uh, N A B C uh, with N A B C is minus N A C B. Uh, oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Um, so it looks rather like a torsion tensor, and in fact it is a torsion tensor. Um, so perhaps I'll give you. Uh, well, so in fact, almost complex structures are equivalent to GL M comma C structures in the sense of G structures uh, I was telling you about, and um, then N is actually the torsion of the uh, of the G structure, uh, of the GLMC structure. Okay, well, so we've got to half past ten, and I will give you a proper definition of the Neuenhaus tensor, but perhaps I'll do it after the break.